So good morning to all of you. And uh, thank you so much, Jörn, for your very warm remarks. And um, I want to also congratulate for you for putting this conference together. You know, the looking at in yourself in global perspective is not something that you should take for granted. No? Education is typically a very inward looking business. It's not natural for teachers to look to the next teacher. It's not natural to, for schools to look to the next school. And it's not natural for education systems to look outwards in the way you have always done in Denmark. And I think this is really a great example for you know, using the world as a kind of laboratory. Looking at how ideas, your ideas have played out somewhere else and how things that you might have wanted to do have actually been done in other countries and vice versa. I think this is a really great starting point. And, um, I want to you know, start, before talking about the future, look a little bit back into the past. You know, as you know, we track the quality of learning outcomes through our international PISA comparisons. And we did this last in science. And the first time we did this was in 2006. If you think about 2006, it's a long, long time ago. And it's very hard to remember those days. Now, it's actually. The one way to remember it is the year before the iPhone was invented. That was a time when we didn't have smartphones. Very hard to imagine. You could say Twitter was still a sound. Amazon used to be a river. And all of those things have changed. And when you look at quality of learning outcomes in sciences in a country like Denmark, we saw slight improvements. But more or less, in 2009, was very similar to how it used to be in 2006, and the world didn't stop in 2009. You remember that maps became dynamic, cars became electric, started to drive without a driver, no? all of those things are the possibilities. And in a way, the quality of learning outcomes measured by the extent to which students can think like a scientist no? has been pretty much the same. And again, just imagine the last three years, you think about your know, robotics cloud computing, biogenetics, big data, huge changes in the world of science around us. Very, very short time period, completely new topics have arisen. And again, you know, we see education not very sort of sensitive to those kinds of developments, no, not responding to this. And that's actually pretty much the global trend. The world is moving much faster than our education systems. Now what, ed, what societies demand from people is changing much faster than our capacity to respond to this. Now, we as humans are built for a kind of linear development, now, gradual. But the world around us is changing in exponentials. This is the age of acceleration. There are few countries you know, where you can say, well, you know, progress has been more steeply. You can think about a country like Portugal. They started actually pretty low on the PISA scale. And they've been you know, step by step moving forward. Countries like Singapore, you know, I just arrived this morning from Singapore. They keep moving from good to great. By the way, like Denmark, also one of those education systems that is very much outward looking. When you look to Singapore, you visit schools, you visit the ministry, you visit teacher training institutions, you find very little that they have invented there. Sort of, you see, oh, that looks familiar, it's somewhere else, and so on. They have actually not so much focus on <coughs> primary research in education, but they have been very, very good in observing what works in what context. And while they never copy things from elsewhere, they ask themselves constantly, how do those kinds of ideas play out in our context? How could we adapt, modify, use the ideas, the best ideas from the world? And they have seen an am amazing progress. And if you think about Singapore in the 1960s, this was a harbor where only 3% of the adult population could read. Now, one of the poorest economies that we can today think of. Now, and today, it's a wealthy country and one that has one of the leading education systems, and keeps thinking of how to reform it. Some of us associate Singapore still with a country, you know, or oh, drilling people, mass education, very front-loaded education. And actually, you know, that's an image that we carry with us. But that's about 20, maybe 15 years the past. If you look to Singapore today, 
you find more in terms of innovative pedagogies than in most places around the world. More experimenting, more kind of development. Every teacher in Singapore would spend about 100 hours every year on research, on development very much engaged in this. Their teachers are seen as the ones who actually drive the system forward, keep innovating. And we sort of have still an image of the past. And I say this because, you know, when they report on television about their results in Singapore, they took, you know, images that are 10 years old, you know, from a kind of drill school or, you know, tutoring school, sort of, to give that image. You go to this country, it's a very, very different place today, and keeps improving, you know, they're not stopping where they are. But they're the exceptions in most countries. In the OECD, the world has been pretty much the same as it used to be about a decade ago, 15 years ago. So that's, I think, the challenge that we have. We see the same in universities. Now we have more and more people getting a university degree, but at the same time, you know, many of them have a hard time finding a job. And employers say they cannot find the people with the skills they need. This kind of gap between what is required and what is actually created is actually getting wider in most places. No? You can say, well, in, in science performance, Denmark does okay. No? It's, a, it's kind of good performer overall. But here's another perspective on this. No? We didn't only look at you know, what students can do in science. Uh, we also asked them, you want to do what would you do in your life? No? And one of the questions is, you know, would you want to become a scientist? And actually, Denmark got the last place on this. No? You can say students do OK on a test, but they want to have nothing to do with this in their lives no? or in their own professional career. No? And that's actually true in many of the high-performing educations as, as well. We look to Finland, we look to Japan, we look to Korea, we look to you know, Germany, China. And you can say it's a similar picture. In a one way, we have succeeded in education. You know, those countries do quite well on the science test. But actually, when you think about student aspirations, they're not very strong in that field. No? And now you look at a country like the United States, you know, they are not a great performer. Actually, they do quite poorly on the PISA test. No? The United States is the only OECD country where the young generation moving into the workforce is no longer better skilled than those moving into retirement in a completely changed world. No? So they're doing poorly on the PISA test. But you can see here, everybody wants to become a science, scientist. No. You look at this chart and you ask yourself, maybe you have to make a choice. You know, either you know, students do well in school, or they have dreams for their future and they want to do something with this. But actually, and it's interesting, when you put all of the picture together, you can look at the countries that do well in, in out outcomes. Countries where students believe in science as a method of social inquiry. You know? And then those where students want to become scientists. And of course, the big question is, can you get in the center of this, where all of those aspects are being developed, the cognitive, social, and emotional aspects related to science? You know? And the interesting thing is, actually, some countries have achieved it. You know? So when you think about our trade-offs, you know, either students have fun, they like science, or they're doing well. No, actually, if you look to countries like Singapore or Canada at a top level, you can see students you know, are good in what they do, they like the subjects, and they see that this relates to themselves. Now, then you have countries like Denmark, where you can say students do OK. They sort of see the value of science, but they don't want to have anything to do with this themselves. Now, and then you know, have a whole range of countries on the left side where you can see you know, everybody thinks about Finland as the greatest education system. Huh? And they're doing really, really well on the test. But as soon as you look to the social and emotional aspects of this, they actually don't come out so well. So this is the kind of multiple dimensions that we need to see. And then you have countries you know, like the United States where students believe in science, they want to become scientists, but school hasn't prepared them for that. No? Looking at this in a multidimensional way is really, I think, something that we take really to heart at the OECD. What are those different dimensions that are really important in this? Well, you know, and then you ask yourself, of course, you know, what links those things, like learning outcomes, the quality of learning outcomes, and the social and emotional aspects? No? And, you know, they can always find answers to this. When actually students do not enjoy science learning in school, you can see that the link between 
the kind of career expectations and performance is very weak. No? Whether you do poorly or do really well, it doesn't matter much in terms of your career kind of aspirations. But when students actually do enjoy science learning in school, you can see suddenly the link between you know, doing better and wanting to become a scientist becomes very strong. You know? And again, it highlights, you know, maybe we should, some people say, well, enjoying science is nice, but you know, the most important thing is that people do well. You, know? you look at this chart and suddenly you see maybe you know, student enjoyment of a subject actually has a meaning. Something that we should look at our own goal. So it's, this is just sort of an illustration of the complexity of things. And then, of course, the big question always behind comparative analysis is what can you do about it? The first thing we all have in mind, you know, just yeah, let's use more money for education. Everybody wants to have more money. And actually, you can see in the chart when you look at you know, spending per student and learning outcomes for you know, countries that spend little actually money makes a huge difference. Now you spend a little bit more, you get a lot better outcomes. But you also see, you know, at some point that relationship becomes very tacit. Some countries spend a lot and don't do so well, some countries spend less and do really well, and overall that relationship becomes, you know, and, and Denmark is a good example here where you can say is a you know, reasonable spender, average performer, but money is not what explains the differences that we see. That raises the question, you know, how we use resources no? as a big point. I'm going to come back to this, but it's important, sort of, there are no simple answers. It's not just, you know, more of the same is going to give us better outcomes. You might think, well, you know, maybe not money, but student learning times. Now, it's a very intuitive assumption. The more time we spend in school, the be better we will actually do in learning outcomes. No? And there's been a lot of you know, increase in learning time over recent years, and it varies a lot. You know? In blue, I have marked the time that students spend in school, and in yellow, the time that students spend out of school. It could be you know, homework, it could be private tutoring, lots of things that happen. And you add it all up, and you can see in a country like the United Arab Emirates, students spend close to 60 hours per week learning. No? That's more than you know, most of us would be allowed to work. No? In Finland, it's little more than half than that. No? Huge differences in the volume of student learning time. No? So, but when you look at the kind of question of learning gains per hour of instruction, no? sort of productivity, you can see that in Finland or Germany or Switzerland or Japan or Estonia, students learn a lot in very little time. And in the UAE, as you can see here, students spend a lot of time and learn very little. No? So again, that also tells us, not so simple. No? It's not about you know, adding one hour more mathematics and you get better math outcomes, or one hour more history, getting better history outcomes. No? Time alone is not the answer, like money. And that really raises questions of how we should look in depth what is behind success in education. No? And you know, then you ask yourself, well, if there are no simple answers, why are things not moving? And uh, we study that quite a lot at the OECD. You know, why is education in general be not as responsive to social change as other sectors in our societies? No? Education is an inherently conservative social enterprise. No? And we as parents are part of the problem, not part of the solution. No? Nobody wants their child, or you know, we, we get all very nervous when our children learn things that we haven't learned when we went to school. No? Or why did they change this message? You know, the old one used to used to well. Parents are always, you know, very critical of this. No? And we even get more nervous when our children no longer learn things that we felt were so terribly important for us. No? It's actually, and I'm going to come back to this in a moment. It's very easy for policymakers to add something new to the curriculum. No? You become very popular. No? Yesterday it was, you know, digital literacy, then comes environmental literacy, tomorrow comes financial literacy. You can all put things on top of the system and everybody's going to be very happy. But you take one thing away and you can cause a revolution. And those countries that have gone through that process of actually focusing their kind of instructional systems have all, you know, been very, very surprised by this. Japan in the end of the 90s to reduce its curriculum that was totally overloaded by 30 percent. 
And that has sort of fundamentally paralyzed uh, the education system because of opposition from stakeholders. No? The status quo has many protectors. It's really hard to change things in education. No? And if we don't understand those dynamics, the views of different stakeholders, we will not be able to support change. No? Of course, you know, when you ask people like this, you know, do you like reform and change and improvement? Everybody says yes. No? But you know, often they think twice when it affects themselves. No? And they like reform in general, but not for their own children. So I think this is something that is really, really important for us to keep in mind. We call it the political economy of change and reform. No? As a policymaker, you can easily lose an election over education. No? I've documented this. There are lots of examples where education played a prominent role in elections to the negative. But you can never win an election over education no? because it takes so much more than an election cycle to see the fruits of your work. No? That's the dilemma for public policy. That's why we see lots of money being spent on things you know, that make you very popular, you know, put another computer in the classroom or make the class a little bit smaller. All of those things are ones that you know, make you very popular. But we see very little action on the things that really make a difference no? because there's no direct payoff. No? In the best possible case, as a minister of education, your successor from the opposition party will reap the benefits of what you've done. So why would you do that? This is the problem. There's also a big asymmetry between the costs and benefits of educational change. Usually, the benefits, if you see slight improvements, everybody profits a, bit, a little bit from this. You know, your learning outcomes improve, your teacher working conditions get better. But nobody stands up for small distributed benefits. No? But the costs will always be concentrated. No? And that's where you get opposition. And you know, few people can undo a lot of change. These things are really, really hard. No? It's often the loss of privilege of you know, people in the system that prevents changes. We call that provider capture. No? The incumbents basically can prevent and then we have very little uh, systemic reform evaluation. You know, a few years ago, in our education policy outlook, we looked at the extent to which education reforms had any plan to study their impact. No? And from 400 reforms that we studied around the world, or the OECD countries, we found 44 who had you know, at least a plan to study impact. I'm not saying that you know, one out of 10 reforms was effective. I'm just saying one out of 10 reforms tried to find out whether they were effective. No? Nine out of 10 reforms had no plan. This tells us something, this lack of systemic reform evaluation. When you talk about research you know, in a school of education, you'll come across this. No? We spend 17 times as much on research and innovation in a field like the medicine than in the field of education. It's not twice as much, it's not three times as much, it's 17 times as much. And that tells you something about you know, our mindset. Do we believe education is a science or do we believe it is an art, you know, just done by some individuals and they know what they're doing, we don't need so much research on this. That's a, we also have a lack of the kind of ecosystems around education. That there's no basically in a, there's no education industry and so on. I think those are really issues that we need to tackle when we want to look at this. Now. But now the question was, you know, how do we move to the future? And I want to lay out a number of trends that uh, what I sort of call the old industrial education systems. And you have to keep in mind that the school system that we have today was essentially invest, invented in the first industrial revolution. Now, we needed, when we needed people to be compliant with the norms of the industrial society, you know, compliance, conformity, those kinds of qualities were at a high premium. That's when we invented the kind of mass school systems, now where students get to the same school at a certain age, where they are promoted year by year, where we teach the same thing to all students. That's the old system. And what distinguishes the future and the world-class systems? The first thing has to do with, you know, in education we tolerate a lot of failure. No? Often we believe students, you know, are talented or not, an education system is meant to sort them in some ways. No? 
And we expect that actually, you know, not, not every will, will succeed. No. And that is actually reflected in the mindset of students. This is the most amazing thing. You know, once in a PISA test, we ask students, you know, what do you believe makes you successful in mathematics? That was in 2012 when we tested mathematics. And you could see a majority of European students say, oh, it's very clear, it's about talent. No? If I'm not born as a genius, I'm going to study some, something else in mathematics. So people, young people, believe that you know, they either had this gene that they could do math, or they didn't, and they had no chance of success. When you ask the very same question to students in China or Singapore, you had 9 out of 10 students who said, if I try really, really hard, I trust my teacher is going to help me, and I'm going to be successful. So in some countries, actually, students believe that the education system is there to help them, and they trust their own abilities. They have this sense of agency. They can change things. Whereas in a lot of education systems, the students have internalized that education is about sorting, and that there's very little they can do about this. No? And the future really is about helping all students to succeed. No? Is this in an abstract dream or a reality? Actually, as we can see in some of our data, it can become a reality. Some countries, basically, social background has virtually no impact on learning outcomes anymore. No? But that was the easy part. The harder part is, you know, how do we actually change the what in education? In the past, you know, it was all about routine cognitive skills, training people once for the lifetime. That was easy. That was about teaching something. Today is much more to do with giving young people the kind of reliable compass and the navigation tools to find their own way in a world that is complex, volatile. No. It's about teaching students for jobs that have not been created, to use technologies that haven't been invented, to solve social problems that we can't yet imagine. No. That is what the future is about, you know, complex ways of thinking, complex ways of doing, collective capacity, social skills. <coughs> Rapid changes in the world. And those things are much, much harder to develop. No. And again, you have resistance from almost every sector, because everybody is challenged. Students, teachers, the system as a whole. And that it requires a very different type of teaching profession. And they've passed also that was about standardization and compliance. Everybody walks in the same way. Everybody is pick at paid in the same way. Everybody sort of does the same thing. And the future is about you know high-level professional knowledge workers. And you're going to see in a moment that we're quite far away from that. We talk about this, but the reality of you know, how we you know, employ uh, teachers is still very, very kind of industrial. No? And of course, that has implications on the work organization. You know, High-level professional you know, knowledge workers don't want to work in a factory no? where everything is hierarchical and tailoristic. They want to work in open, collegial, flat environments. No? And that, in turn, has implications on the way in which we use knowledge in education. In the past, you know, knowledge is flowing upwards in the education system. We report to our school principal, and the school principal report to the local community, and so on. The future is about networks of knowledge creation. That's what I said at the very beginning. It's very hard in education to connect people, to connect institutions, to create a combination of professional autonomy in a collaborative culture. So as I say, the big transition I want to talk about in the remainder of my talk. Let's start with the first thing. How do we move actually from getting young people to reproduce what we know towards doing things that we do not know? Education has become very good in giving young people the knowledge that we have. Knowledge transmission is very dominant. But education is not so good in asking students to question the established wisdom of our times, no? to connect the dots where the next innovation is going to come from. That is where the future needs to look at. And if you actually look towards you know, what it is, does it mean to create knowledge, to, you can see actually the impact of digitalization. No? On the one hand, you can see digitalization is an incredibly democratizing force. No? Everybody can participate. Everybody can collaborate, you know, networks. Digitalization has enabled us actually to act as a society. But at the same time, digitalization is also an incredibly concentrating power. 
at a rate that we've never seen before. Now you look at Google and these big companies, they basically have concentrated power at a rate that we've never seen in the past. It's a force that is incredibly particularizing. The smallest voice can be heard anywhere. You post something on Twitter and anybody can know. But the other side of it is that it's an incredibly homogenizing force. It's actually often squashing you know, cultural uniqueness, differentiation, and so on. It's an incredibly empowering force. You, know, you can go here through Copenhagen, you find actually single entrepreneurs who have a big idea who can change the world. In fact, you look at this worldwide. In the last 10 years, the biggest companies that have been created had the product before they had the money. They had an idea and changed the world with an idea. They didn't have a large company. They didn't have a big, you know, whether it's Microsoft or Google or Facebook. They started out with an idea, and that has changed the world. That is a big difference to the industrial age, where you had, you had a lot of money, a lot of people, a big infrastructure, and then many years after, you could do something. That's a great part of it. But we also can see that digitalization is incredibly disempowering, actually taking away things from us. We exchange you know, things to do with freedom. We exchange you know, our capacity. Uh, I mean, when you drive here by car, you have you know, a machine telling you whether to go left and right. Algorithms dictate what we think, what we do, and actually a lot of that is today implicit, and I think that's the other phase. And where you end up on that chart here has a lot to do with your knowledge and skills. When you actually look at the place of work, what we see is that there is a big shift from routine tasks to non-routine tasks. Now, basically, the kind of things that are easy to teach, easy to test, are also easy to digitize. That's basically on the routine world. And then we can see tasks that are technology intensive are on the rise. And you put the two things together, you can see the world of work is fundamentally changing. Non-routine cognitive skills and ICT intensive skills are dominating our workplace. And you can see this in the light of data as well. The category with the steepest decline in the demand in the workplace is what education does best, no routine cognitive skills. And you would be surprised. I know you think, well, Denmark is not that. You know, we are so much focused on you know, creative tasks and collaborative tasks. Look at this in the light of some data. You'll be surprised by this. The task category is the steepest. The rise in demand actually is about social skills. No? The capacity of people to collaborate, communicate, compete. No? Those things have become more important. <laughs> In a time of artificial intelligence, we need to think much harder of what it means to be human. So big changes in this world in which we live. And some people have framed this as a race between technology and education. You know, Before the first industrial revolution, neither technology or education made a big difference for most of people. No? Then came the industrial revolution, moving technology ahead of the skills of people. And while today you know, we benefit from the Industrial Revolution, you wouldn't have wanted to live in those days because actually most people suffered really badly because they were not prepared. But as I already said, that's the time when we invented public schooling and that created a huge amount of prosperity. Since then, sort of things have remained pretty flat. And now we see the digital revolution doing the same thing again, moving technology way ahead of the capacities of people. And you know, that's the social pain that is starting to emerge. You know? Whether it's growing disparities in our societies, growing sort of impact. <clears throat> and the question that we have to ask ourselves is, you know, how do we move people once again ahead of the technology of our times? And from my perspective at the OSD, I think we're far too slow in that. You know? We're far too much sort of vested in the current education systems and think far too little about the future of education. But in, once again, you know, if you think about you know, what does the technology do to education in school, you know, started out with a kind of smartphone you know, in the 2006, 2007, 8 technology in the fingertips of everyone. Then the virtual world and the real world somehow began to merge. You know, and then everybody got connected. Now, those are the three steps that we have seen over the last decade. And, uh, while this has happened, actually it's become much harder to navigate the world. Things that were 
relatively easy, like think about literacy. Literacy before the digital world was about you know, extracting knowledge from something that was written by someone else. No? Processing linear information. And actually, when you read something, you could generally trust that what you read is true. No? An encyclopedia would be a resource that you could be pretty much trust. No? Today, you look up something on Google, and you find 50,000 answers to your question, and nobody tells you what's right and wrong, what's true, what's not true. No? Literacy has advanced from extracting knowledge to actually constructing knowledge, uh, triangulating knowledge, information, much, much harder task to do, uh, posing very, very big challenges to students. And, you know, I said everybody's connected, that's true, but actually it's much harder for young people to experience the diversity of our societies than it used to be in the past. Uh. In the past, you go out on the market, you meet lots of different people, and you encounter diversity. School was the place where you would encounter diversity. Uh. Today, the kind of social media that we use make you talk to people who think like you, make you work with people who walk like you. Actually, they create silos and walls in our societies. Now. That is a trend that schools are confronting. Now. The power of technology, but also its other consequences. It makes schooling so much more difficult, so much more harder in the world we live. And when you basically ask young people, you know, how they relate to technology, you can see that the majority of students at 15 years in Denmark say, I feel really bad if I'm not connected. No. Being connected to the internet has become like breathing air or drinking water. No. And when you look at the time that people spend online, outside a regular school day, you can see across the countries in just three years, 2012 to 2015, some countries this has doubled and every country has increased. This is the pace of change that we see around. The virtual world is becoming the real world for many young people. And we're going to see the results for 2018 in a very short time. I you know, predict that actually the digital world is gradually squeezing out the real world for young people. That's the reality in which we are. And you know, digitalization is just one of those global megatrends. I talk, could talk a lot about a lot of other things. No? Knowledge is expanding, and the complexity of our world is expanding. No? And knowledge has so many facets, no? There's so many interesting things in the world. But what we should never forget, that learning is always a social and relational experience. No? Basically, you learn very little in abstract. You learn through people with people no, in school. A relational kind of process. And then the world of the school, is, of the curriculum, is so tiny compared with that. No. And somehow we have this temptation to put everything into this little box. And everything that we see around us, something, everybody, you know, health education, digital literacy, environmental education, everybody wants to have everything done in this little box, because we still have this idea that schooling has to prepare you once and for all for your life. No? But what happens is the moment you actually put those things into the box, they become often very shallow representations of themselves. No? Science is a great example. You ask Danish students in primary school, they all love science. No? Science is about experimenting, observing the world, seeing how things you know, work out, it's a really amazing kind of tool to actually experience the world. You ask Danish students at age 15, the attitudes to science, you saw that at the beginning, many of them hate science. Science has become a boring school subject with formulas and equations that has actually very little to do with the ideas of science. The ideas of thinking like a scientist. And our reaction has been, you know, put more and more and more and more things into this box. And that's basically what we experience in the today's school curriculum. We lose track of the big world of learning, you know, the realm of human knowledge, you know, what distinguishes us from technology. You know. How do we educate you know, first class humans rather than second class robots? You know, the realm of ethics and judgments, political and civic life, creativity, aesthetics and design, a long list of things that really make us human. And they are often you know, on the margins because they get crowded out by curriculum content. Now, this is something, thanks to Jörn, we have been working at the OECD for a long time. Now, how in this complex world can we think about the future 
in a strategic world. And I, I know that you're going to have a separate presentation on this. I will limit myself to very few key elements. When you think about knowledge in education, knowledge is always important. And some people say all curricula should be knowledge-based. But actually, even when you talk about knowledge, disciplinary knowledge becomes less important because you can look it up. But in order to be able to look it up, you have to understand the nature of a discipline. There's a shift from content knowledge to what we call epistemic understanding. Can you think like a philosopher? Can you think like a scientist? Can you think like a mathematician? Can you think like an historian? Right? <laughs> Not looking at history as you know an agglomeration of names and places and people, but as understanding how the narrative of a society has evolved and how sometimes it unravels. Mathematics, not about you know, formulas and equations, but about you know, having a deep conceptual understanding of space, of a mathematical relationship, the ideas behind math. And actually, you're going to see that in a moment. We do a lot less of this than you think in school. And what I showed you at the beginning was not the trend in content knowledge in science, where we did see progress, but the trend in epistemic understanding in science, where we have seen virtually no change. The world has shifted you know, from understanding something towards being able to think in a discipline, and often in multiple ways. And that's not advancing. When you think about skills, you first think about cognitive skills, creativity, critical thinking, and so on. But in fact, social and emotional skills are the ones that gain most rapidly in value. No? And now, you know, collaborative skills, everybody says this in the curriculum. But then, you know, we still put students behind an individual desk. And at the end of the year, we give them a test where they have to prove that they are better than their neighbor. No? So that's not the way to develop social skills. No? And attitudes and values. I know that's the most kind of controversial aspect of an education system. Should education be about values? How explicitly should they be framed in, in an instructional system? Is this something for public policy? Or should that be left to parents? I must say, we at the OECD, in a kind of project on the future of education, have a very clear, clear view on this. Attitudes and values are the center of a good curriculum. In fact, you know, when I was in Singapore, it's quite impressive how they have made that transition since a long time. The center of the curriculum there are not you know, disciplines, math, science, reading, but ideas and values, no? tolerance, openness. No? Those are the key ideas. And when you teach sports in Singapore, you're not you know, evaluated on to what extent our, your students are athletic. But you have to ask yourself every day to what extent you know, does sport contribute to people taking responsibility for themselves and for others, you know, to be courageous, to be sort of have leadership capacity. So every in subject is there to frame those kinds of values. I think it's a very, very different approach, but one that gains in the future. And when we talk about competence at the OECD, this is about your capacity to mobilize your cognitive, social, and emotional resources in a given context. You know. And we look at sort of three, the, the center of this is student agency. In the world of today, you know, the test of truth for success is not you know, what you have absorbed, but what activity you can take, what level of responsibility you have. Creating new value is important. Your capacity to develop things of intrinsic positive force. Your capacity to manage tensions and dilemmas. Navigate conflicting viewpoints. Your capacity to take responsibility. So what does it mean for education, you know? First of all, our capacity to be open to the future. And again, as I said, you know, we are filling people up with knowledge. We are actually not giving them the keys to question the knowledge of our times, to think beyond the boundaries of knowledge. Not, to see the forest among the trees, no? to step back, look at the bigger picture, and then to take action. Those are in the views of the community that we have established, the key challenges for education in our times. Now, one of the things that we have done, we've actually looked at to what extent those things are a reality. And I highlight a couple of education systems that are generally viewed as very strong. When we think about successful education, you know, Canada always comes out on top. They do well on PISA and most international comparison. And actually, what you can see, many of the dimensions of the kind of 2030 framework that we have 
are embedded right across the curriculum. For example, critical thinking. No? They are not only doing, you know, in, in a specific subject, they do that in the humanities, in math, in language. So critical thinking is something that the curriculum from, from Ontario is really valued. No? Communication, problem solving skills, the well developed. No? But you can see other aspects, you know, self-regulation, resilience, empathy that are not present in the curriculum. I'm not saying they are not present in instructional practice. I'm sure there are lots of Canadian teachers who put a lot of premium on empathy, on social skills, and so on. But that's not something foreseen by the education system. It may happen, but it's not part of the intention. No. Look at another one. Again, you know, a very high-performing systems now in Asia, Japan. Everybody looks to Japan. The Canadians were so good on critical thinking, actually the Japanese don't put that much of a premium on that. No. Critical thinking is not one of the strengths of the system. But you can see social skills, no? very, very strong in Japan. They were not very strong in the case of Canada. No? And in fact, when we did the assessment of collaborative problem solving skills, social skills in 2015 in Pisa, we could see the Japanese did really, really well on that. No? For me, that was one of the most interesting findings. You know, you take China and Japan. Both come out very, very strong on individual problem solving skills. No? That's what they learned to do well. But the Japanese did very well on social problem solving skills, not collaborative, and the Chinese did very badly on this. And actually, part of the answer lies here. In the Japanese case, you know, social skills is built into everything they do. They're very large classes, and the stronger students have the weaker students. It's all about collaboration. Students cook the meal with the teacher. They actually clean the school building at the end of the school day with their teachers. And it's not about saving their money for a room cleaner is about making this a collaborative exercise. No? This is a big thing for them, and you can see this. But, you know, you look at other things. Entrepreneurship, you know, student agency, the center of success in 2030. No? Totally absent in the case of the Japanese curriculum. No? So, what I'm showing you here, even in some of the really successful education systems today, the ideas for the future, some are present, but not all. What you also see is we can learn a lot from each other by looking around the world in those kinds of exercises. But I want to look at the second challenge, and that is you know, moving from sorting to actually helping all students succeed. Some people say, well, you know, poverty is de destiny. I'm going to skip all of that. Um, but I want to show you actually that's not so easy. What I've done here is, is basically looked at learning outcomes by decile of social background. No? These are the 10% most disadvantaged students in the Dominican Republic, and they do really poorly. No? The students from wealthy families do OK. And now you look at this and say, well, I could have told you this without the PISA test. No? Students from wealthy families do always better than students from poor families. No? But you, know, you look at this across countries, and the students in the red dot have the same social background across countries. And the students in the green dot have the same social background across countries. And you can see, for example, the 10% most disadvantaged students in Estonia or Vietnam do as well as the average student in the OECD and pretty much as well as the average student in Denmark. So poverty is not destiny. Actually, some systems are much better than others to leverage the talent of disadvantage. Actually, you know, take Vietnam. It's a rather poor country. But actually, the 10% most disadvantaged students do better than the 10% wealthy students in virtually every Latin American country. So the excuse in Latin America that poverty is the problem is something that international comparisons really expose as a weakness in our kind of understanding in the systems that we have. We make it far too easy to use social background as an apology for this. And part of this is, you know, in, uh, lies in how we, where we tolerate variance. No? Denmark is one of the countries where you should pride yourself is that you have very little performance variation across the school system. No? In fact, you know, I know there's a lot of debate of, uh, about you know, choosing the right school and so on, but actually it makes very little difference. Now there's actually, when you look at the total variation in learning outcomes, not much difference between schools. You can send your child to any school, get similar outcomes. But what people often don't realize there's a lot of variability in learning outcomes within a school. No. And that's an issue. Many students fall through the cracks, and nobody sees that. No. People care about the school they chose. They are looking actually much less in much less detail at what happens inside the school. No. 
And you can see this in another way, in a, in a third way, how do we allocate resources to schools? No? Ideally, you want to be in the green part of the chart. Now, the future is about aligning resources with needs, now, making sure that we attract the most talented teacher to the most challenging classrooms, get the best school principals into the toughest schools. No? And you can see when you look at Denmark, actually, when it comes to material resources, Denmark is doing really well. You cannot see, it's still in the red part, but not significantly so. So basically, you can say schools for children from all social backgrounds get similar resources. But when you come to the quality of teaching, it's quite deep in the red. And that shows actually, again, you know, there's something that makes it more attractive for teachers to work in a well-off school than in a disadvantaged school. And this is hard to change. You can see the very few countries where the red dot gets near to the green line and very few where it gets above the green line. I think this is something that education needs to take to heart. We need to make it not only financially attractive for teachers, but intellectually attractive for teachers to take on the toughest classroom and the toughest schools if we want to give all students a fair chance to succeed. Now, on the surface, we have done this. I think this is a really interesting analysis that we did. We can actually show you that <coughs> as a tendency, if you are in the kind of most disadvantaged schools, you have more teachers. Classes get smaller. No? So Denmark and most countries actually put more teachers into more disadvantaged classrooms. No? And this sounds very equitable. No? This sounds the right thing to do. If you have more disadvantage, you put more resources. But actually, when you look at teacher quality, it goes exactly the opposite way. No? Basically, the shortage of qualified teachers is much bigger in a disadvantaged class than in a privileged class. No? And that is actually what matters when you actually look at what predicts learning outcomes. It's not the quantity of teachers, it's the quality of teachers. And most of our education systems are still regressive in this sense. No? And um, I must tell you, actually, some systems have got around this. You know, when I look at where my children go to school in France, it works like this. Basically, the more years of experience you have as a teacher, the more choice you have where you want your children to go to school. So what happens is that all the experienced teachers choose the easy schools, no? in the center of Paris or wherever. It's sort of nice to live and nice to work. And the people who just graduate from university, they are dumped, but nobody wants to go. You know, the empty places are. So that's exactly what you could see here. When you look at Shanghai in China, one of the things that impressed me most is that they give children from disadvantage the best schools, the best teachers. How do they do that? They build every career, every teacher career around disadvantage. If you're a vice principal in a high-performing school and one day you say, I want to become a principal, the system will tell you that's a great aspiration, but first, you know, help us turn around one of the lowest performing schools. If you're a teacher, they have four stages in the career. You know, if you want to become a teacher in a higher stage, right, great aspiration, but first take on one of the most difficult classes. Every career is built through challenge now. It's prestigious for people, the most disadvantaged schools. You know, if you go to the outskirts of Shanghai, that's where you find all the immigrant schools, you know, where basically, you know, you, you, it's hard to imagine for us in Europe, but they have about 500,000 people coming into the city every year. You know? 500,000, half a million people. And they are not you know, wealthy parents, they are the poor peasants from the countryside who bring there to get to work in Shanghai. Huh? So they have you know, vast amounts of schools that are newly built, but they have the longest list of applicants for teaching positions. Why? Because it's the elevator to a, a successful career. So there are ways to change this, but it's really, really hard. No? How do we move from a system where people look upwards to a system where people look outwards? Very hard to do in education. We measure teacher professionalism through three aspects. And that's now from our TALIS survey. The first, of course, is the knowledge that teachers have. Obviously, you know, the first thing that your students figure out is whether you're really, really good in your subject. That's the ownership, teacher ownership over a subject is what students find out first. But it's only one element of teacher knowledge. You also need to understand you know, how students actually learn the curriculum of a subject. The knowledge about your students. Again, that's something very different. And the European pattern basically is we ask teachers to teach and we give them very little time for other things than teaching. Teachers are there to convey knowledge. Very different in Asia. 
In Singapore and China, you teach between 11 and 16 hours per week, half of what a Danish teacher teaches. But you actually work more than a Danish teacher when it comes to the number of hours they spend. But they spend a lot more time with individual students as a teacher. They spend a lot more time working with other teachers. So that relationship, that knowledge about the individual student is much better. When you go to a school in you know, China and Hong Kong, you find usually the school principal welcoming every student at the school gate by name. They know every student by name. And these are schools with 1,000, 2,000 schools. That's an image of you know, what it takes. There. So knowledge about t students. The teacher professional autonomy. No? How are teachers creative designers of innovative environments? And then the collaborative culture. Now at the OECD, as you know, we score everybody on everything. And uh, we have measured those things. No? And you can actually see there's a huge difference. No? When you look at Denmark, teacher knowledge is so-so. Uh, teacher professional autonomy is very big. Now, teachers have a lot of discretion of what they do in the classroom. But the green bar is very small. No? The collaborative culture is not very well developed. So there are differences across countries. And they, for example, if you would you know, combine the strengths of Denmark, you know, professional autonomy, with the strengths of you know, Singapore or Shanghai in terms of a collaborative culture in the teaching <coughs> profession, you could create the highest index on teacher professionalization in Denmark. So different countries having different strengths. And the picture is even more problematic than what I show you here. The green bar is small, but it's actually smallest in the parts that matter most. Have a look at this. From our TALIS survey, we looked at how teachers actually collaborate. And the red bar is about Denmark. You can see when it comes to you know, superficial collaboration, sharing resources, conferences, and so on, that is happening in Danish schools. But when it comes to the kind of areas of deep professional collaboration, Actually, that is very rare. Now, team teaching, still quite popular, but collaborative professional development, very rare. No. Joint activities, you know, learning across the curriculum, project-based learning, and so on, not very prominent. And then classroom observation, learning from my fellow teachers, almost non-existing. No. And there are examples from other countries where those things actually are more common. No. Why do I say that? Because our data also show that teachers teach jointly as a team, where they observe other teachers' classes, provide feedback, and joint, engage in joint activities, pay, take part in collaborative learning. Actually, the degree of teachers' ownership is much better. These are the best predictors for teacher professional in the collaborative culture. So as you can see, different strengths, different weaknesses. But as we move to the future of teaching and learning, those things are going to be much more important. Now, the kind of top-down philosophy in a rapidly changing world will no longer work. Now, the pipeline has become much too long, much too slow. Now, it's about building more frontline capacity, and that essentially is about building a collaborative culture. And you can see that in the data, how these things really matter when it comes to a teacher's <coughs> self-efficacy. Now, and that brings me to, uh, just to bring a little bit of controversy into this, into resources. No. On the vertical axis, you see the student's teacher ratio. This is how generous you are in terms of teacher supply. No. The lower you are, the more generous you are with your teachers. And sort of Denmark is an average country. No. The number of teachers per student is like it is in most OECD countries. And on the horizontal axis, I have the size of the class. No. And you know, compare Denmark with, for example, China. Both countries are equally generous with teacher supply. No? Same number of teachers for every 100 students. But in China, the classes are very large. And in Denmark, the classes are very small. And now you will tell me, well, Denmark does the right thing. It's much better to have smaller classes. No? But again, think about that carefully. What does it mean if you have an average number of teachers and a smaller class? It means that teachers have less time to do other things than teaching. Less time to engage in professional development. Less time to spread with individual students. Basically, the non-teaching working time is more limited. In the case of China, I mentioned already, you know, you have good supply of teachers and a very large class. And that means teachers can do a lot of other things than teaching. And they spend a lot of time reinventing their profession. And they're incentivized and encouraged to do so. 
If you have a great idea, you know, in, in China about something that you want to do in your school, it's actually easy for you to get a research grant from the government. Very easy to get money for exploring new ideas. At the end of the year, if you find yourself very successful, you write a report, and then you send it to the administration, and then they will not tell you it's right or wrong. They will tell you, looks interesting, but show us you can replicate this in 10 other schools, no? in other places with other people. If you're successful there, and again successful, you, one day you're going to become an experimental school, which is the highest kind of status of a school. So lots of time for other things in teaching. So again, you know, we should look at size of classes in the context of many other things. The, the drive to smaller classes in the Western world had a big impact on the structure of education and the work organization. This is what has made our schools more and more tailoristic. My teachers do something, and the psychologist does something, and the social worker does something, and so on. People focus on a small segment of the work, and nobody takes care of the student as a whole. That's something I think we need to take to heart, and when I think about the future of education, a more holistic approach is probably really, really important. Here comes also something interesting. You can say, well, you know, smaller classes may not be the right thing to do, but they still make teachers happy. No. We looked at this. No. We asked teachers how happy they are with their work. We didn't say, you know, are you happy with a larger class or a smaller class? We would have known the answer. But we asked them just, you know, how happy are you with your work? And then we looked at how large their classes were. And we found no relationship, no. Yeah. basically like this. No. Teacher job satisfaction was unrelated to this. But teacher job satisfaction was very closely related to the degree of professionalization. No. Now remember, professionalization is about teacher knowledge teacher professional autonomy, and the collaborative culture. Where those three things were well developed, you had teachers who were satisfied with the profession, satisfied with their work environment, very sort of had a sense of their own ownership and effectiveness, and also had a higher perception of the status of the teaching profession. Isn't that interesting? That the status of the teaching profession, the perception of teachers, how they were viewed by society, had less to do with society and more to do with the way in which the work of teachers has been organized. So again, you know, these are the things in the future we've got to think about more carefully. How do we move from an environment of prescription to you know, ownership of professional practice? <coughs> and I'm going to show you this just on the bare, bare basis of one example. We, you know, in our Thales survey, asked teachers about their pedagogical vision and ideas. And you can see, for example, Danish teachers, most teachers say, my role as a teacher is to facilitate students' own inquiry. You can say, you know, it's a very constructivist, modern view of teachers. You have 92% who say students learn best by finding solutions on their own. And you will say, well, that's how pedagogy should be. It's a constructivist kind of view. And, you know, 80% say thinking and reasoning is more important than curriculum content. The problem is if Danish teachers would do what they say, they would probably be number one on the PISA test. But when you actually ask students, you know, what experience, what they actually experience in the classroom, for example, elaboration strategies. This is your in the student experience that you know, you connect the unfamiliar with the familiar. You <coughs> find your own pathway to learning. It's the kind of mirror image of a constructive aesthetic, you can see that's actually not very prevalent in the case of Denmark. No. So on the one hand, teachers say that's the aspiration. The reality seems to be quite different from that. And unfortunately, it's the reality of the experience that determines what the outcomes are. No. So this should give us to think. But it, what it also shows is that there are other places where that aspect is better developed. Does it matter? You know. That's in a really interesting way how we looked at this. We looked at the likelihood of success on the PISA tasks, depending on the difficulty of the task. And you can actually see those kinds of elaboration strategies did not have much predictive power at the lower end of the difficulty distribution. Now, if you, you know, have to solve a task which involves applying the multiplication tables, that's probably not very constructive. This methodology is very effective. No. But what you can very clearly see is the task at the high end, the most complex mathematics task, they require those kinds of learning strategies. 
And that's one of the explanations why Danish students are not very good at those tasks that are unstructured, very complex, where you need to sort of be very innovative in problem solving. That's so very important. When it comes to memorization, that's something that Denmark does quite well. Memorization is not very prevalent in the instructional system. And you can see that's a good thing because we can see, you know, memorization helps you for the very easy tasks, but as the tasks get more complex, it is actually not only neutral but counterproductive. If you have an unstructured, you know, open dynamic problem solving task and you try to remember the correct solution, you will never find it. So, and, and we can see this in the data, and I think that's the strengths in Denmark. But overall, you can see they're making the kind of aspiration of teachers towards a constructivist view of education a reality. is still a, a very important gap. No. Last but not least, and this is going to be the end, and I think I only have three more minutes, um, who, who makes decisions about school? I know that's also a big topic in Denmark, and here I'll show you some data from our publication, Education at a Glance. In fact, well, it's interesting, you know, you would argue, and most people would argue that Denmark is a highly localized education system with a lot of, you know, responsibility at the front line. You look at this in the light of data, yeah, you know, for about a third of decisions, the school has a role. But, you know, if you look to the Netherlands, the Czech Republic, England, Latvia, Flemish community, there would be a lot more responsibility on the shoulders of school principals and teachers, you know, collectively. So again, it's sometimes good to look at this in the light of international comparisons. No? And uh, of course, you know, then we look at the uh, sub-levels and municipality levels. That's where there's a lot of responsibility in Denmark. But actually what our data show is that it's usually what happens at the front line that is most decisive in terms of shaping learning outcomes. Whether, you know, decisions are get made at the local community or the region or the, or the national level, we can't find much of a difference that makes. The only differentiator in our work is a school level. And that's something, you know, sometimes what looks very, you know, devolved, decentralized from the perspective of the school may not be as much. And also what you can see is, you know, in many countries, I mentioned, you know, England and the Netherlands, when there's a lot of responsibility on schools, the role of school leaders is defined differently and often you know, reflected in much higher levels of pay, whereas you can see in Denmark is only a very, very small difference between the teacher and the school. So those things do have implications. Now, you think about, you know, the past was divided teachers and content is divided by subjects and student destinations. Schools are very good in keeping students inside and everything else in the world outside. Now, and the future is about more integrated ways of looking at this. Now, integration of subjects, cross-disciplinary learning, integration of students, integration of learning contexts, now, integration of real world kind of connects. Now. The biggest risk for schooling is not its inefficiency. It is that it's losing relevance. Now, that's basically, I think, the, what young, when you see young people dropping out of school, very rarely the material conditions decide if it's the aspirations of students, the relevance, perceived relevance. Isn't it? It's moving from a tradition of standardization and compliance towards actually fostering ingenuity in schools, the creativity at the front line everywhere. And this, I promise, is going to be the last piece of data I wanted to present to you. But we ask students, ask teachers, you know, if they were more innovative in their teaching, would that be recognized, rewarded? Would the system appreciate people being different from the rest? And what you can see, there is just about a quarter of teachers who perceive schools to be an innovation-friendly environment. Most teachers still see schools as something that is you know, about conformity, being like the other teachers, about compliance. And if we do not change that perception, we'll probably change very little. But I leave you here. Thank you very much.